everyone. Hi, hello. Welcome to another very exciting episode of Allison Rosen is your new best friend. I am thrilled to have my guest today. She's someone that I am very fond of. Returning to the podcast, Stephanie Whittles Wax. She is an author, an activist, a podcast host. She is the co-founder and chief con chief creative officer of the podcast network, the very critically acclaimed and popular and important podcast network, Lemonada Media. She hosts Last Day, the podcast that in its first season looked at the opioid crisis in America and now is in its, its second season premiered in October and it is looking at suicide. She is the author of Everything is Horrible and Wonderful about losing her brother Harris Whittles, um, very... Uh, beloved and hilarious comedy writer, he had also been on the show, um, to heroin overdose. Hello. Oh my gosh. That that was so nice. I also love your theme music and I was singing it today because I knew I was coming on. And so I was working and I was singing Allison Rose. I was like, oh, it was in my head all day. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you very much. It's so fun so- to have a theme song that says your name. Is that so fun and you sh- cool? You that should. It's really cool. Yeah, I do. I, and I've had that song even before this show was a podcast when it was just an internet streaming just I'm so belittling to myself when it was an internet <laughs> streaming show, which is how it started when I lived in New York. Um, mm, and so good. Yeah. And so that it, it's gone away. It was like one of the few things in my life, because I can be very indecisive, but it was one of the few thing- things in my life where the second I heard it, I was like, oh my God, it's perfect. It's so catchy. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, and kudos Listen, to flesh. Tom Rapp, a.k.a. Trap Dog, who did that song and all the music. Um, do you think that it would be inappropriate for Last Day mm-hmm. if you had like a zippy Stephanie Whittles Wax song? Yeah, I was thinking that, actually, as I was hearing your theme song and dancing, how weird it would be if it was like, <laughs> Stephanie Whittles Wax is on Last Day. It's the most depressing thing you've ever fucking heard. Yeah, it wouldn't. <laughs> I don't think it would have the same kind of ring. But I love that you can have it. It's so nice. Thank you. Um <laughs> I want to get into all all the stuff, but first, the last time we talked, um, you were still living in Houston, and then you relocated. Fill me in, because I have built up your lifestyle in my head, and I need to know what it really is. Oh, my gosh. I can't wait to hear what you think it is. That's very interesting. From, like, Instagram, right? You've just seen it, and you've just decided what it is. Well, I think because... You said you were coming to California and I and I'm like, oh, where are you going to move? Let's be neighbors. And you're like, yeah. well, that sounds great. But we found this piece right. of land up in Northern California. And so that that's what kickstarted. M- totally. Like you, I, you're homesteading. I don't know who I am or what I'm doing here. I know that there is a lot of talk this day on my uh, text messages from the street about the well that is now sort of out of water. <laughs> oh. So, I mean, if that gives you some sort of insight. So we, let me back up. We, let me back up actually even further. Basically, the day we got married, this was, you know, eight years ago. Mm-hmm. My husband was basically like, listen to me. I love you. If we are in Houston our entire lives, I will be done with this marriage. <laughs> and I was like, okay, I promise we'll move like five years. We'll be here five years and we'll move, you know? So like cut to, it's been way longer than five years. I did not hold up my my end of the bargain. You know, Houston is this like lovely place in terms of community. I had such a great group of friends there and, and it's a very creative, artistic community. Mm-hmm. You don't think of it that way, but a lot of great stuff going on there. My family was there, blah, 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 blah. Not a pretty city. Um, essentially a, a city on a swamp. It mm. is a hot, muggy, sticky, mosquito-infested, prone to mass flooding. Uh, it just sh- does. It should not be a city. And they keep building it out. Definitely never work for the tourism committee. No, no. Um, so what? Ha- so Mike has been sending me real estate listings for 
years, years. And he'll send me listings all over the world. Um, <laughs> and I'm like, no, 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 no. Like if we were doing a rom-com, there would be a <laughs> montage of me being like, no, no. Um, so finally, the pandemic happens. I don't know if you're familiar, but uh, oh, we, we all had to go inside. Which one? <laughs> yeah. The current and, one? Um, yeah. The current one. And we we had – so the two children, one being six, the other two, um, we lived in a townhouse in the middle of the city. The yard was teeny, itty-bitty, tiny, like a shoebox. Dog, you know, it, it, you can't be outside. It's too sweaty. There's nowhere to play. They can't go to school. We can't leave the house, you know. And it's so I was in this very – um, vulnerable state. I felt like my soul was being sucked out of my body and he knew it. He knew it. And I think <laughs> he intentionally fed me a gummy. He had one too. And sent me a listing for this gorgeous, idyllic plot of land, two and a half acres Wow! in a canyon. We're in a canyon in the Monterey area. And it's just every when we moved here, everyone was like, "This is God's country. This is God's country." You know, you're in God's country. There's a lot of montages in this story. And Mike and I were like, "Is there a script they hand out when people move to the area?" Um, you know, and it what I mean, the weather is just beautiful. It's like seventy seventy degrees during the day, and you know, forty to fifty at night. It's you know, there's stars, and the house is this mid century modern sort of relic. There was this old. They built it in 1963. The couple lived here until a year and a half ago, and it's pretty much untouched. Um, and we're mid-century modern, you know, crazy people. So anyway, it was like I was high. I was like, <laughs> yeah, why are we living like this? Why could we not live like this? And it was cheaper. This is the part that's going to blow your mind. It was cheaper than the houses I had been looking for in the area of Houston we were living in. Mm -hmm. So we were living in the middle of the city, like a really, you know, high traffic area. And like all the things that were attractive about living there were suddenly unattractive when you couldn't leave the house, which I'm sure you have experienced in the Los Angeles Oh, area. yeah. I also – we're not going anywhere, but I have fantasized about it. Like I, I am right. jealous of the people who are – basically, that's why I'm fantasizing about the lifestyle you're doing because I'm just like, yeah. why are – all the reasons right. we were here don't matter anymore. Our moot now. Yeah, yeah. totally. And um, I mean, it sucks because there is definitely a house in Houston that has not sold. If you live in Houston and you want a house, I've got one. Uh, it's a great location when we're <laughs> vaccinated. But right now, the fact that it's zoned to this great school and walkable to this and such, nobody gives a shit about. So it's mm -hmm. sort of just sitting there. Um, so anyway, we... My father-in-law is a realtor in Long Beach. And... So he has this license in California. And so he's also the greatest and um, very also prone to choices that might not make sense on the surface. And so he was fully supportive of this idea pretty much right off the bat. Well, and you would be getting closer to him, too. Exactly. And we had been talking about L.A. We had been talking about L.A. Mm -hmm. When I talked to you about L.A., I was not lying. We had been talking about it. But then when the pandemic happened, it was like, wait a minute. I want my yeah. kids to dig in the dirt. I want them to be able to go outside the house and there not be cars that are zipping by at 60 miles an hour. I, you know, there were these things that I envisioned mm -hmm. in this new life. So we got an RV. We rented an RV. Wow. We drove to California with both kids. It was a two-week thing in the middle of the summer. It was – that was a whole other fucking thing. Like the air conditioner broke on the RV. Oh, RVs God. actually are not made for children. They don't have car seat hookups. So you're basically like crossing your fingers and hoping <laughs> for the best with the car seat. <laughs> Um, like it's just sitting here, in a seat. It's sitting on the seat and then you're strapping it into basically a two by four. Mm. It's it's it is scary. I, I still get chills as a Jewish mother when I think <laughs> about what we did. Uh -huh. I feel I still feel the panic rising in my <laughs> body as I'm telling you about it. Um. So anyway, and I also have seen your backyard. It's beautiful. And it's our yard was Probably like a fourth of the size of what you currently we, have. So it, yes, we do have a yard. Mm -hmm. You have a beautiful yard and there's room, right? Um, So we came out here. We did the inspection. I remember the inspector literally said, listen, I'm going to charge you less for this inspection. He was going to charge us 700. He's like, I'm going to charge you 600 because I only like needed to be here for an hour and a half. This is a good fucking house. It's built really strong. 
you should take this house. I mean, the inspector was just like, take the house. And we were like, all right, fuck it. We'll take the house. I mean, and so we we did it. We moved across the country. And Mike works for me. We, you know, he's our art director. So Mm -hmm. every creative asset you see for Lemonada, Mike has designed. So we can be anywhere. We can be remote. And we have employees all over the country. Um, So we did it. We moved. And... And this is the fucked up part. We moved and then two weeks later had to evacuate for wildfire. Yes, I remember. Which was a mile from our house. Where did you go? Um, we went to, we really slummed it. We went to a, a, an adorable little B- Airbnb in Carmel by the Sea. It was, uh, it was a total <laughs> piece of shit. Um, no, it was, it was, it was great. I, I shouldn't complain. We, well, that's still you know, scary have though. Means and it was fucking scary. I, I was certain considering my history of trauma that our house was would be burned down. I was yeah. certain that we had done this crazy thing where we had moved across the country and that we had taken this big leap and we were going to start this new chapter and then it was going to burn, um, which is just how my brain is wired, mm-hmm. you know? Was it wired um, that way before you lost Harris? I think, I think it had a propensity for that. Um, there's a lot of worrying and anxiety in the family bloodline. Mm-hmm. But I think it triggered, like all of it got really bad. And then it, it, this is this is the sensation. Maybe maybe I'll say this for hey, is this just me or everybody? But the <laughs> sensation is that um, there is a dark cloud, and that that if there is a bad thing that can happen, it will happen here. Mm-hmm. Like. And 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 the reason that I feel that way is because it has. <laughs> like yeah. Harris did die. And then I have two kids that have hearing problems. I'm not gonna call it a problem. I'm not gonna call it a problem. Um, hearing disabilities. And uh those are like one in a thousand kids. And, you know, a lot of like lightning striking. And then mm. like there had not been a wildfire here for 70 years, and then we move here and within two weeks there's a wildfire. So I I feel like I'm prone to bad things happening. Right. Do you feel that way? Or is that like a weird, is that something that is just, um, um, I need to work through in therapy? No, at different (laughs) times of my life, I have, and it does have to do with my proximity to the bad thing having happened. Right. Um, You know, there were a few things in my life where, with my dad's health, where it like he had a heart attack and it, and it was like one that's referred to as the widow maker um it like a mm. big one and so it was he was really lucky that he lived mm-hmm. and after that i remember thinking like oh i think in general like if something you know things are going to be like it made me sort of optimistic and then then when something happened where it didn't break my way um, I was like surprised and angry. I mean, along with the grief. And then after that, I mean, I really think that it's like whatever the most recent thing that happened is your brain says that's how it's going to go. Yeah. Your me. brain writes writes the script of, yeah, this is just the way it is now. Yeah. Um, but it, the other thing is, as human beings, we're all, you know, starring in our own show. And, you know, I know logically that the world that I am not I am yeah. but a but a but a particle <laughs> and that the world is doing nothing to me. I right, know that logically. Right. I feel like I'm fucked, you know. <laughs> so, um, but anyway, so we did move, and the the pictures are beautiful. I'm glad that they seem that way on Instagram because qu- it is beautiful here. Question: You came out in an RV, <laughs> and then you did the inspection. Like, were you maybe not going to take the house? Yeah. So then, what would you have done? Just turned back had two more had another two weeks back to houston i mean we were gonna have to do that anyway because we hadn't packed up our right. house I we see. basically you know it was at this point it was still sort of like okay mike let's humor mike <laughs> mike is such a great guy mike does everything well and good and he always gets put at the back of the line let's go out there and humor mike on an rv (laughs) and then we like get there and i was like oh shit we have to move here yeah and yeah and and we did (laughs) so do you like it now it is i i i I feel like i'm living in an airbnb because i don't know anyone here Mm. i truly 
don't have any connections or community, which is a weird thing, especially coming from a place where I did. Um, so I feel like I'm visiting mm-hmm. and that I'm in a beautiful place and I'm just sort of like, oh, this is a nice – this is such a nice Airbnb. I'm going to write a good review. Uh, and I think once we can be in the world, I I hope – that it will feel more real. Mm-hmm. But right now it just feels sort of like we're floating, right. you know? Yeah, it's hard. I mean, I realized as I asked the question, do you like it, that it's it's a real weird time to assess that because I've, it's not yeah, real I've life. I have no idea. Yeah. I mean, Mike asked me the, the other day, he's like, what do, what do you think? Do you like this? Do you like it here? What do you think? I'm like, I don't know. It is it is very rural. Like I said, we are on a well system. Um, I am not close to restaurants that I can pick food up at. So I'm cooking mm. constantly. The grocery store is 10 minutes away. That's the closest one. So these things feel like when the world picks up again, they might be problematic for me. <laughs> right. And what about schools? Like how far is the school? The school's like 30 minutes away. Oh, wow. I mean, but here's the thing. We So, so that's our fault. We were zoned to a neighborhood school that is six minutes away and iris was doing first grade online and it was a lot of worksheets Mm -hmm. and um like zoom calls and i don't know really uninspiring shit that was killing her soul and um we met this one family here because I put up basically a dating profile for Iris on a Facebook group. <laughs> and I was like, here's a picture of my daughter. She loves to do this. She loves to do that. She's so cool. Um, and I was like, this is totally weird and pathetic. But does anyone want to be friends oh, with her? so sweet. <laughs> I mean, well, I just felt like she needs somebody. And I felt like if I could find her one friend mm-hmm. who could be safe, you know, they, we could be safe together. And we did. We found this one family that they're so lovely. And the mom actually had listened to my show before. It was like a random. Oh, that's weird. Cool. Out yeah. of all people. And um, so she had some context. Because I don't know if we would be for everyone. You know, I don't know <laughs> if like we would like be, you know, we're we're not we're a little eccentric. Um, so anyway, they they to- we totally hit it off with them. Iris has a new best friend. And. They we do one and one, so they come here one day a week. We go there one day a week, and um, they went to this charter school that's a Waldorf school. Oh yes, I've I I forget what it is exactly, but I've heard good things. Yeah. Oh my gosh, it's a game changer. She started there in October, and and it's amazing. It's like all about kind of like digging in the dirt and loving the earth and feeling connected and patience and compassion and love and all these things that I want for her. She's reading. I'm like, I don't really care about that. I feel like she's smart. I want her to be a good Mm -hmm. person. Yes. So I felt like she was really dying on the vine, like a lot of our children are currently Mm -hmm. in this pandemic world. Right. And I have this understanding that it it will not end anytime soon. And so it's like, well, let's get her in somewhere for this school year. But now that she's in there, I think it'll 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 be a half hour drive we have to make twice a day. Sadly. Hey, it's only, you know, an hour, but it'll balloon to more. <laughs> I feel like it does That's because right. <clears throat> I feel like and I haven't had to do this lately, but no matter what time I think that we need to leave the house, if I'm taking the kids somewhere, it is like we always end up leaving 45 minutes later than that because it just takes forever to get little people forever. buckled in and all of that. I mean, your kids are still really little. Yes. You have Okay, how old are you? 3 and <clears throat> Yeah, Elliot, they'll both they'll be 4 and 2. They both have February birthdays, so they'll be 4 and 2 in February. So right now, 3 and 1. Oh my god. But the 3-year-old, almost 4-year-old, every day it's a little bit easier. It's um, yeah. I mean, I know that four is supposed to be a tough age, too, but like just in terms of just the chaos of trying to get a two year old to do anything. I mean, I can remember so clearly trying to take him to the toddler class that he did at his preschool before he started preschool. And like he had he just had this big fit 
And I was trying to get him into his car seat and he refused and he like went tearing down the street and like throwing stuff. And yes. it yes, was correct. embarrassing and scary. And at mm-hmm. least those days with him are behind us. And I think we're heading into them with my second. That is where we are currently with, with Harry. Harry. Uh, he is I, the the way that I can draw it out, visualize, express it to you is that we're on this sort of mountain thing. And my mom and dad who are living here now, that's a whole other story. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. We're like living in a communal Are they house. living in your, on your, on your land? They're living in my house. Oh my we God. have three bedrooms. They are in one of them. Amazing. And the children are sharing a bedroom <laughs> and it is very fucking intense. Um, but my mom was like... Every time he runs around the house, he's going to fall off that hill. You have got to build a fence, right? And so mm. she's like every day yelling at me about it. So oh, like, you mean fine. literally you're on a hill. I was like in – I was like tucked into the metaphor. <laughs> no, I am literally on a hill and there was a chance that he would fall down because he's a terror. Yeah, right. And so we built the fence. Then once we build the fence, there's still a little thing that he could sort of – we keep sort of like, now we will build a retaining wall. Mm. Now we will put in more – because we're trying to stop this person from harming himself. Right. And I think we just have to lean into the fact that he will harm himself. We He will – I mean, that is part of like the two-year-old boy thing. And I hate to gender him in that way. But, dude, he is so different than my seven-year-old girl. Mm-hmm. So different. You have two boys. So I'm wondering if – you have this experience of of them like hurting themselves physically yes. like running elliot is tumbling less so this way owen is very if it's possible for a one-year-old to be athletic like he's very he can throw really well like he has really good aim he's very athletic his favorite thing to do is to be outside which is very yes. not me or my husband <laughs> he loves balls he loves cars all that stuff and he yes. <clears throat> went through a phase where he would just walk up to a table and go boom, <laughs> just boom his Bash head, bash his head, yes, into the table, and he had mm-hmm. a bruise under his eye, and it happened on the nanny's watch, and mm. I felt very like, yikes, like what is going on? Why, you know, anytime right. he gets hurt on her, anytime he gets hurt on her watch, it always freaks. Even though I love her, she's the best. We don't currently have her, but. I love her. She's the best. But I actually, it was my therapist who's like, little kids get hurt all like, this is what, yeah. this is what toddlers do. Because this I was is like, what is they she, do. you know, is, is, is there like someone not, is she not is watching? Is she like him? not paying attention? Right. Is there some neglect? So yeah. I felt horrible about this bruise under, it wasn't a black eye, but it was mm-hmm. a br- bruise in the eye area. Um, and then it finally healed. And then on my watch, he did it again. I was like, you've yeah. got to be kidding me. So then we just actually yeah. took the table out and replaced it with a round table. And he hasn't <laughs> done right. it since. But, right. Yeah. But this is what it's like. You constantly try to protect their environment mm-hmm. in this way that just feels futile. Um, and he, and uh, aside from the physical antics, he's just lost his fucking mind. I mean, he's just like screaming and crying and resi- and like yeah. the tantrums have gotten so intense and I forgot how intense they are. I know I r- have a recollection vaguely. I mean, it's been almost 5 years since mm-hmm. my daughter was 2. Right. Um and I, I don't know. The meltdowns really, they just How do they They can take it out of you. Uh, yes. I remember because it's been, it feels like it's been a little while now for me too, and the fact that it's going to start up again is just feels. Why me, God? It, it feels yeah. unfair. <laughs> Even yeah. though I definitely signed up for, I did IVF. I paid a shitload of money for this joy. <laughs> um, but I paid for this. I paid for that this. feeling of like afterwards when everyone's calm. Okay, now I need to go in another room and cry. Yeah, like it's very intense. It's very intense, and I find it to be exceptionally intense when we are all stuck together Yes, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. For sure. I didn't realize that Harry also had a hearing disability. Yeah, he's profoundly deaf in one ear, and he has normal hearing <laughs> in the other. Um, so it's a completely different type of loss than Iris. Iris has what's called mild to moderate bilateral loss. So she wears hearing aids. She's worn them since she was six weeks old. 
Harry basically didn't develop a cochlea Mm -hmm. in utero on one of his ears. And so it's not even an option to have technology on the ear. There's nothing to – it's a beautiful prop ear. (laughs) The most gorgeous prop ear I've ever seen. It's crafted from – just the most perfect <laughs> specimen of flesh. I mean, he's he's such a beautiful child. Um, but yeah, it doesn't doesn't function. Um, what's been amazing is that I have had a lot of you know just guilt because we were so aggressively on top of it with Iris and you know got her aided and got her early intervention and all this stuff. With Harry, it was like the doctor was like, yeah, you, you know, you can't really can't really do anything and. You know, he'll pro- he'll probably be okay. It's one of those like he'll probably develop okay, and that just feels so not who I am. Mm-hmm. I don't I don't want to know. He I want to do everything I can to make it totally okay. Right. Um. You don't want your kid to probably be okay. No. Retaining wall, right? fence, all the yeah. Things. Yeah. I mean, that's just not. No parent is like, yeah, I want my kid to probably be okay. <laughs> um, right. You know, it's like so. I would, um, I would be like, her. what does that mean, and what do what I need to do mean? to make sure yeah, that it's yeah. okay? Right, exactly. Um, but he, he is okay. I mean, he's been, um, he speaks in paragraphs. There's been absolutely no delays whatsoever. Um, he, he's hilarious, which is truly the biggest requirement <laughs> to yeah. stay in the house. <laughs> Um, so yeah, so he, he has that too. It's something we do not ever notice. Um, you know, when he goes to school, they tell us he might, like whenever you have instant, like noise, like chair shuffling and mm-hmm. ACs rumbling and this is the issue. Like I hear a plane right now. Um, we have this ability in our ears to filter that stuff out mm-hmm. when you have hearing loss of any kind, it just gets a little hard. Um, that's why like noisy restaurants and things like that are hard for people. Um, so we'll we'll see. But I, I remember very clearly hearing his diagnosis, you know, hitting the ground, sobbing, being so devastated about it. And then 24 hours later, being in the shower and having this like talk with myself that was like, listen, listen, kid, <laughs> to me. Um, Iris is a perfect human being. Nothing has stopped her. If anything, she is even more magical. Do not sit here and despair about your kid not being the way that you thought he mm-hmm. should be. Like, get your shit together. Get out of the fucking shower. Love your kid. Celebrate the good stuff and move the fuck on. You know, I mean, I really did have to have a pep talk. And and that's how I pep talk myself with all those expletives. <laughs> and then, you know, truly, since then, it's like, yeah. It's it's okay. And if it's not okay, it's fine. We'll figure it yeah. out, you know. When did you find out? I mean, same kind of a thing. It was like they they do the new, newborn hearing screenings in the oh, hospital. Yeah. And with him, it was so different because with her, I was like in the bathroom. I remember Mike was helping me pee. I was like pulling down the, the big mm-hmm. mesh underwear and I was, you know, dealing with that. And they come in and do all these routine things. One of them is a newborn hearing screening. And with Iris, I didn't even pay attention. I was like, yeah, I don't care. Whatever. Do it. And then she didn't pass the screen three days in a row. By the third day, I was like, oh, God, this doesn't feel good. And it was both ears. With Mm -hmm. Harry, he passed one ear, didn't pass the other. And since that was so different than hers, I thought, oh, I had this false hope. Yeah. I thought, oh, because I had a C-section, maybe he has fluid in the one ear. Because Iris never passed a test in Mm -hmm. any ear. Um, And then because we already had relationships with the audiologists who were incredible, um. I was able to say to her, can I come in to your facility in a few days when I'm out of the hospital and you can retest him with all your better equipment and I love you and trust you and, you know, and so she ran the test again and I remember the first thing she said to me, she was like, well, and I knew because I'm, t- I'm not new to this. This was not my first rodeo. So I know when it takes a long time that there's a problem. Right. I know. And the other thing is. The way they do hearing tests is that they play these beeps in the ear and mm-hmm. then the brain registers the sound and you see a wave mm-hmm. on the screen. Well, I was hearing these very loud buzzes, like very loud through the earplugs on in his ear. So I was thinking, oh, shit. Like, like they have it cranked up. That's loud. I'm like, oh, God, that's not good. Yeah. So I was sort of 
prep for it. But the thing she said to me, she said, okay, um, he does. He does have a hearing loss, but it is a very different kind than Iris's. And that's sort of how she laid it out. And she showed me the paper and it sh- she said, this is, this year is totally typical. This year is profoundly deaf. And I was like, okay. <laughs> and then our pediatrician was like, yep, you got struck by lightning twice. And I was wow. like, cool. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you for your time. <laughs> um. But yeah, it, it's, uh, you know, again, it's like something I did not anticipate being part of my life. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's a, it's a pretty small part now. I mean, Iris, like her battery dies. She changes it. She loves her hearing aids. They're sparkly. They have purple and pink glitter on them. <laughs> what could be better? Um, so let's talk about last day. Oh, um, my gosh. Yes. On to the next. <laughs> How did you decide what the second season would be focused on? So we knew uh, early on that we wanted to talk about epidemics that are getting worse and very stigmatized and really hard to understand and explain. So things that you constantly see on your Twitter feed <laughs> and you scroll by, you know, but you're like, oh, God, you know, statistics, statistics, statistic, mm-hmm. um, and they don't hit you on a human level. Those are the stories we're interested in telling. And we kept getting in season one, we would get um, emails from people where addiction, overdose, suicide, mental illness, depression, all of these were sort of sort of the sort of part of the same world. Mm -hmm. Um, So we always sort of had it in our mind that we would be going there next. And then um, once we got to the end of the season... It was very clear. It just felt like we'd gotten enough um, emails about it and feedback about it that it seemed like we would be able to to talk about it. And we also like to do things that that do have the potential for progress Mm -hmm. and hope. Like you don't think that a series about things that are killing you are going to be hopeful stories. But what I really like to sort of tap into is that it doesn't have to be this way. Mm-hmm. If if we could do things better from a systemic level all the way to the way that we deal with things in our own families. Um, and when I say better, I, I am not pointing the finger at anyone because I am one of those families, which I think is what softens the blow of the show a little bit mm-hmm. is that I'm not ever saying like, oh, man, you guys really <laughs> blew it. Because um, <laughs> – if that's the case, we we did too. I think we're all blowing it as a society. Mm-hmm. So the shows are heavy, obviously, um, but also I think hopeful because we always talk about solutions. So that's that's why we decided to do suicide. And how was your experience different, your personal experience of doing the show different from the first to the second? Oh, man. Um massively different you know the first one it was i was crying the entire i was on the journey Mm -hmm. i was the one who was um going like what did what did i do wrong what could i have done differently how did this happen and i learned so much from episode one to episode 26 in season one i learned so much more about addiction than i ever knew or understood. And now when people are like, what are the five things you learned? I can be like, boom, 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 boom. Here are the things. Also, caveat, we could have done all of those things differently and Harris still could have died, mm-hmm. right? I mean, that's the thing. You, you, I don't want anyone to ever listen to the show and be like, well, if I do all of this, it will end okay. Because there's a lot of variables and that's what we're learning to do in the show. So the first one I was just very personally in the middle of, um, this one has been a different experience because I'm kind of on the outside of it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm like reporting it in a way that feels like there's a, a barrier there that I think is good <laughs> for me. Um, but then there have been moments where I just am openly weeping on the, on the, on an interview with people, you know, where it's just like I feel – you know, one loss is like another loss in ways. Like one tragic loss, I can feel so empathetically. I 
can feel that, mm-hmm. you know? Um, I mean, they are obviously very different, but so there are moments that that feel really hard. I I am sort of grateful that there's a little bit of distance this season because I don't think I could have done any more of what happened the first season. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, dragging my own family through this. Uh, but I think we all ended it with uh, a way clearer understanding of what happened, which I hope people will get out of season two as well. So <clears> – <throat> Um, throughout the series, um, but especially in the first episode, you talk about the guidelines for how media is supposed to talk about suicide and you partner with the Jed Foundation. Um, yep. and which is like, it's a, it's a really, I don't know how, um, aware of it at the time when you were when you decided to partner with them and to sort of have them help you with these things but it's like a very compelling from a storytelling point of view to almost have these like ombudsmen in there (laughs) yeah i i we needed them because because of what what we just talked about it wasn't my experience and Mm -hmm. i knew there was a lot of there's a website called reporting on suicide.org there are a lot of rules around it the way that you talk about it can be extremely harmful and i certainly didn't want to make anybody's life worse i didn't want to tap into someone who was already struggling and suffering and and drive them somewhere they shouldn't go and so the Jed Foundation was critical. I, I didn't – I did not feel – I was not going to move forward <laughs> with season two without a mental health professional on the team, without someone who had had a ton of experience dealing with this particular topic. I felt really out of my depths. I'm not a journalist. I am not a mental health person. I went to theater school. <laughs> like I I am a creator, but I, uh, I felt like – this is literally life and death. Mm-hmm. Um, and they've they've been really helpful in, in the way that like you hear us in the show, they'll be like, that's a shitty idea. Mm-hmm. Don't do that idea. And we'll be like, no, no, no. I mean, well, tell us why, you know, and then they'll they'll sort of highlight all of the pitfalls and then we'll weave that into the storytelling. Um, part of how we like to tell stories is to talk about the process of telling mm-hmm. the stories and um. We didn't plan for them to be characters in the show, but I really like how they have become characters in the show. Did – and I should I should say I am not <laughs> fully aware of what – like what – of all the guidelines. And in fact, I yeah. have received emails from people telling, you know, telling me I should have put a warning on something and, mm-hmm. you know, here's – and it is sent in like a – from a really good place – and I should have read it. I just haven't. But so I, as I talk now, I am aware that I may step in it in different places. Um, did you feel constrained or confined at all by the guidelines? Not at all. In fact, I felt annoyed by the guidelines um, at first because I was like, ugh. <laughs> <laughs> Like, I'm not a journalist. I don't, what, you know, <laughs> I feel annoyed by all guidelines. Let me just preface that with mm-hmm. I do not appreciate rules of any kind. My husband will tell you. I get very insulted by them. <laughs> um, don't put me in a box. Um, so I felt that kind of rebellious thing that I typically feel. And then once you dive into them, you realize, okay, this actually, if we can – use these as constraints then that actually is helpful to sort of have a framework to work Mm -hmm. in to work within um and jed was really helpful with that as well because the the guidelines are really overwhelming i mean i'm so i'm on the site right now yeah i pulled it up so it's like a very long list avoid there's an avoid column and an instead column so it says avoid describing or depicting the method and location of the suicide and in the very first episode, yeah. we talked about the Golden Gate Bridge. And the Jed Foundation was like, you are breaking that rule. And we were like, we are, but we're doing it intentionally because we want to talk about the rules in episode one. Um, you know, and so I've learned as we've gone on that I've internalized them in this way that I never, ever now say committed suicide. Never do it. It's not in my vocabulary anymore. It has been erased from my vocabulary. Instead, I say died by suicide. And the um, idea behind that being that committed suicide is 
glorifying. It's like a crime. It's oh, a crime. Okay. It's like you you committed this. You right. did something. Got you it. Know. And it and it plays into this stigma piece that's mm-hmm. so entrenched in in the conversation. Um, even the the trigger warnings themselves are something that we really unpacked in the first episode. Um, our trigger warning is very different for last day. We say, listen, uh, I'm not going to tell you what you can and can't hear because your experience is very different. And in fact, you might really relate to this and it might help you even though it might be triggering. Something that is triggering could actually really sort of help if you feel res- it resonates mm-hmm. with you. It can help with your growth. It can help with your self-reflection. If you feel overwhelmed, press pause. We say press pause. Um, take a walk, take a breath, come back to like t- take days to listen to an episode if you need to. Um, so I've learned a lot from that. And then the other big thing that I've learned is that the way that we edit the stories now, I n- so like, um, for example, we did an episode recently, really every episode, where the family or the person we'll talk to will share all of the details about mm-hmm. the death and how it happened and where it happened and the circumstances around it. And we always cut that out. We never included in the storytelling. Um, now I just, it's part of it. I I, I feel um, like I don't feel like I'm pushing against that at all. I don't mm-hmm. feel like it's restraining me. I feel like it's um, helpful, you know, to have guidelines for this. And I mean, at the end of the day, like the the thing to note about the rules are that and this took me a few episodes to really understand. People who are listening to this right now, if they have never had suicidal ideation or they have never felt like I just want things to end or I want I don't want to be here anymore, it's not like it's going to flip a switch mm-hmm. where you're talking about it is going to trigger something in them that they'd never thought about. It's that if you have somebody out there that's listening that is currently struggling or has sort of had ideation – that they could hear this and then it could be sort of the the thing that sort of pushes it mm-hmm. over the edge. Mm-hmm. So um, it's not that the the way that you're reporting it is going to cause somebody to die, but it can cause somebody's situation to be worsened. Does that right. make sense? Yes. Um, it's not like a super happy person is going to be like, la, 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 and then hear this and be like, oh, wow, right. my life is over. It's ruined. Um, but we want to protect families who have experienced this kind of loss. I don't ever want to make families feel bad. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, I felt bad for a really long time. I don't want to make anyone else feel bad. I want to be a source of comfort for those people. Um, so, yeah, we've internalized it in a way that feels productive and helpful. Do you tell – when they share all the details with you, which I imagine is how is healing for them to share their story, mm-hmm. do you tell them that – you're not going to include it. I don't think. No, it's so interesting. They they never ask. So I think because we have done now like over thirty of these, I think they know that we're going to handle it respectfully. Mm-hmm. It's really scary to put yourself out there and then like basically put your story in the hands of strangers and be like, "Hey, yeah. <laughs> this is my life. This is my pain. Please uh tell it in a way that doesn't." like rob me of more yeah. you know um but i think we are very clear that we are going to be respectful about the storytelling from the start and that if anything makes them uncomfortable please communicate that and we always go back and fact check things and you know we're always in conversation with the people we're telling stories about and then a lot of the stories i'd say the majority are people who've reached out to us and mm-hmm. they've heard the show and they're like hey i have a story that i want to share with you so that we're not approaching people and saying like hey we're this podcast do you want to come on and tell your most painful stuff <laughs> to me <laughs> you know <laughs> um you know it's like amazing to me how many people hear it and they want to share their mm-hmm. most painful story um so yeah what's well, kind of a testament to the, the project itself. Yeah, I think so. I think it's um yeah, it's 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 like a vote of confidence. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Um 
If you think you may be depressed or you're feeling overwhelmed or anxious, BetterHelp Online Counseling offers licensed professional therapists who are trained to listen and to help with issues, including anxiety, depression, relationship conflicts, LGBT matters, self-esteem, and more. Simply fill out a questionnaire to help assess your specific needs and then get matched with your counselor in under 48 hours. Everything you share is confidential. Easily schedule secure video or phone sessions, plus exchange unlimited messages to communicate with your therapist at your convenience. Um, Something I always like to underline is that if you don't feel like it's a good match with your therapist, you can let them know and you can change as many times as you want. I think it's really important to point that out because people might be worried to start up with a new therapist right now thinking like, oh, what if it's not a good match? I don't want to be committed. You are not committed at all. They will get you to the right person. BetterHelp is an affordable option and our listeners get 10% off your first month with the discount code best friend. Get started today at BetterHelp. That's better com slash best friend, betterhelp.com slash best friend. Talk to a therapist online and get help. I also want to tell you guys about something that makes an amazing gift uh, and helps give back. It's Bomba Socks. They're the most comfortable socks in the world. They'll make you loathe your other socks. You'll wonder why you wasted your time with socks that don't have all the like arch support and reinforcements. I mean, they hug your feet and they were made to give literally. When you give a pair of super comfortable Bombas socks, you're not only giving someone a gift they'll love, you're also donating a specially designed pair to someone in need because for every pair of socks Bombas sells, they donate a pair to someone experiencing homelessness across the U.S. And socks are the number one most requested clothing item in homeless shelters. So the generosity of giving Bombas will make a meaningful impact this holiday season. And I'm not overstating it. They're truly the best socks ever, and they really will make you, you'll want to clear out your sock drawer so you can fit more Bombas and then, and you can yell at your old socks for not being Bombas. From comfort to kindness and everything in between, Bombas aren't just givable. They were made to give. Go to Bombas, B-O-M-B-A-S dot com slash best friend today and get 20% off your first order. That's Bombas, B-O-M-B-A-S dot com slash best friend, Bombas dot com slash best friend. And also, Rothy's. Stephanie, do you know Rothy's? Uh, do I know Rothy's? Are you wearing them right yes. now? They're super stylish. They're super comfortable. They're comfortable, washable, sustainable shoes. They're made from recycled plastic water bottles. Water bottles. And I thought, well, I don't want crunchy shoes. They're not. It's amazing. They're like they're like super soft. They're the only shoes that I know of that you can wear right out of the box and you don't get blisters. And they're super stylish, available in a range of styles. They sell out though. So you're you're gonna want to collect them. You're gonna want to go there, see the new styles they have, and then buy them before someone else does. Um <laughs> yeah, you just you can't have too many. Zero break-in period. Super popular. Glamour magazine named them one of the top gift ideas you can't go wrong with. Check out all the amazing shoes, bags, and masks available right now at rothys.com slash Allison. That's rothys, R-O-T-H-Y-S dot com slash Allison. Style and sustainability meet to create your new favorites. Head to rothys.com slash Allison today. Okay. And I am back. Um... And I wrote something down and I can't read my own writing. So that is helpful. What a um, tragedy. It is. Last day, I feel se- last day season three, my notepad. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I might, I'm going to put it into the, the bullet pointed list of options because I feel that very much. I always, I never read my own. It's very hard. It's, it's difficult. <laughs> um, okay. Deeply personal question. Have you mm. ever been suicidal? No. Nope. Have I been extremely fucking depressed? Yep. (laughs) Uh, Extremely depressed, anxious, obsessive, spiraling. I mean, a ton of problems in my brain. Mm -hmm. Never been suicidal. Could not relate to that personally. Um, Do you think uh, had you not lost your brother – do you think you would be on this path that you're on now of like um, digging, telling people, telling these very profound life and death story, meaningful life and death stories? No, no, resolutely no. <laughs> There's no way. <laughs> no, it's not. I, it's, I mean, you, we've we've now. This is our third show together. 
Yeah. I feel like we're we're friends now. Um yes. in in real life too. And I don't I'm not a this is you wouldn't peg me for a <laughs> a death show. Um it's not it's not I mean but I think that's why the show works for people mm-hmm. is that there's still a sense of humor in the episodes. I still say all the bad words that I say every day. Um, I still, you know, like my producer knows if there's some very intense monologue she wants me to live to deliver with a lot of academic information and very dense stats and statistics, she's going to have to break it up and I'm going to have to make some jokes or I'm going to like <laughs> be like, nope, not coming out of my mouth. Like it's so I think I think that it because I've able because I have been able to make it my own and weave my own that's my dog I'm sorry that's okay um personality into it it doesn't feel like um I don't know the other way to say it but a funeral dirge you know mm-hmm. um which you know I I I was trained as an actor and a director and I taught acting for 10 years to really amazing gifted kids at a performing arts high school. And I would always tell them to play the opposite. Like whenever a scene wasn't working or something, I'd be like, oh God, it's because you're, it, it's all too much emotion, you know? Mm. <laughs> Mood spelled backwards is doom, children. <laughs> um, you know, we need to lighten it up. People don't sob and scream and holler in real life. They just do that in fiction. In real life, we try to push that down and make a joke or play the opposite. And so, um, I just believe that as a storytelling <laughs> tool and and device. Mm-hmm. Um, so I don't think that this would be what I would be doing or talking about. Um, but like I, you know, I don't, I don't know. It's such a, it's so weird and mind fucky when you start doing that. When you start doing the, what would I be doing if this hadn't happened? Yeah. Game. <clears throat> um, I don't know. But I mean, I guess. And this might this might be me projecting a bit because I am always drawn to like these kinds of things as well and and telling these stories and you know wanting to know like but how did you really feel and all that stuff so so I I have decided that you are also like that <laughs> that's true <laughs> I am um and I'm wondering like were you I mean I know I know that specifically the podcast network and specifically the podcast know that is an outgrowth of your experience, but were you drawn towards that stuff before? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, um, I mean, I was a theater director, <laughs> right? Very, yeah, very dark. No, that's like rich, rich pageant right there. The, all the time. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> totally. There was a lot of feelings that I had uh, always. So yeah, this isn't like out of my wheelhouse. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just I don't think that – I never would have met Jess. Uh, I never would have – we never would have both, you know, lost our brothers and then started this <laughs> right. podcast company out of the ashes. You know, that would not have happened. Um, I wouldn't have – I probably wouldn't have written uh, a book that was so, you know, super raw and personal and uh, and tragic. Um but I did, you know, after Iris was diagnosed, I wrote a very personal sort of gut-wrenching essay about that. I mean, I always expressed myself in that way, um, but I don't know if it would be about these topics necessarily. Um, and then I also like – I think I told, like I did anime. I still do. I was an anime voice actor for like mm-hmm. – I've been an anime voice actor for 15 years. So that's my my other career that, that is, is sort so of cool. kept in the shadows and under my maiden name. Stephanie Whittles. If you they'll never put Stephanie Whittles, you'll see a lot of anime. Let me tell you, that is just (laughs) so cool. Um, Another deeply personal question: How? So it's we're five years out now, right? From almost six. How is your grief like on a day to day level these days? I mean, so this is (laughs) okay. Do you see under over this shoulder that? Little creepy doll is Harris's doll. Mm -hmm. That painting Harris did. Um, This boat is his. He's right over there. Oh, who did that painting? Um, Some artist did this painting of him. It's so beautiful, isn't it? Isn't it it so good? I really like it. 
It was in Iris's nursery mm-hmm. uh, in Houston and then in Harry's. And now it sits right next to me. Um, so he's like everywhere. He's all over me. There's mm-hmm. an article about him right there. Um, so I feel like my grief, it, it's so wrapped in. I have this bulletin board here where I have somebody sent me a needle pointed. Um, we're all horrible and wonderful and figuring it out. Mm-hmm. This need, little needle point thing that they did. And then I have a note that he wrote me and. I mean, I'm like, he's so around me. It might be really weird and creepy to some people, but for me, I, I don't know. I, I need him around me. And mm-hmm. so it's like, it's, um, he feels very present still. I think my acute grief, I will talk about it in medical terms, has subsided. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think a lot of that was like, uh, what do you call it when you immerse, immersion therapy? <laughs> 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 Where you're, you know, I, for a year was grieving mm-hmm. um, and writing the book and just weeping and like being very, very in touch with how painful and shitty everything was. And um, doing the show, I think doing the 26 episodes helped me to kind of let myself off of the hook in terms of a lot of the guilt that I felt and, you know, culpability as a family that you, Well, I'm not going to speak for other people. I will just speak for my experience. Uh, My experience was that I felt like, did I do enough Mm. to help him? And so I was able to get those questions answered. So I didn't have a lot that was left unresolved. Mm -hmm. What remains is like, it fucking sucks that he's not here. Like, it fucking sucks that he does not know these badass kids that Mm -hmm. live here. (laughs) I mean, he would love them it sucks that i can't text him a hundred times a day to talk about how crazy my parents are (laughs) you know i mean it sucks that i can't text him to talk about um the undoing or the crown or Mm -hmm. all the shit that we're watching i mean i i want to be in touch with him (laughs) yeah that's what remains um and I think that's part of grief, but it's it's not like I'm crying all the time. I will cry sometimes and mm-hmm. it will come from nowhere. And I'm like, holy shit, that was a wave of grief that I uh, had not anticipated that really derailed my day. Mm-hmm. Um, but it really it, – they say that grief changes and they would be correct. It yeah. does uh, change. And and we did an episode – episode three of the show – which I talk about all the time because it was um, really intense and uh, I still think about it constantly, but it was with Dr. Jeremy Richmond who um, died by suicide seven years after losing his daughter in Sandy Hook. And we talk a lot on the, the show about how that acute period of grief, um, especially if you've lost a child, a lot of people who lose children end up Um, feeling that more intensely seven to 10 years out Mm -hmm. because there's this delayed. Right. Because the, and the community isn't around them anymore. Exactly. Exactly. And people just sort of, yeah, it's like, this is just the way it is now. And when you kind of accept Mm -hmm. that this is the way it is now, um, that's a whole other layer of grief. So I, I don't know how it will be, you know, next year. I know that, um, right now, That is where I am with it. And also Iris talks about him all the time. I mean, she's like constantly talking about her Uncle Harris and, um, you know, he's just like really alive here Mm -hmm. for us. So how is it with your parents in the third bedroom? (laughs) Okay. Okay. Your eyes. If if anyone wants to see, actually, let me just, let me just switch the view so we can for sure see your eyes. YouTube.com slash Allison Rosen if you need to see Stephanie's reaction to that question. (laughs) Okay, there's some ripping your face off motions happening. (laughs) Yeah, I'm like, I know my mom's going to listen to this because she listens to everything because she's such a good mom. Um, But it's fucking intense. Like, uh, she would tell you the same thing. (laughs) She uh, had no desire to be a 70-year-old nanny. And yet, (laughs) here we are. She had no desire to move across the country. And yet, here we are. Um... You know, I think it is a very profoundly difficult time 
I think if we had to be separated from them, it would be a lot worse, though. I mean, mm-hmm. I think us being on top of each other certainly has its drawbacks. Um, but I think ultimately, if we were having to socially distance from them, it would be awful. So I'm grateful that they are here. Um, my dad has Parkinson's. If you want to hear him talking, I put him on episode four because we're talking about senior suicides, which mm-hmm. a- which actually seniors are the most at risk for suicide. It's not portrayed that way, but they are. Yeah, I didn't realize that because whenever I yep. hear of a senior committing suicide, I'm always like, what? Because in my mind, for some reason, I think of it as a sort of like schizophrenia tends to affect a certain age group. I think that that's when it would happen, but but no. Yep. We like to depict teenagers who mm-hmm. are angsty and die that way, um, which does happen, obviously. Um, but re- in fact, middle-aged white men and seniors are the most at risk. Um, so go ahead and think about that if you are listening. <laughs> um, but I, I did an episode about about that and – we were telling the story about a woman who lost her 70-year-old mother. Um, and my dad has Parkinson's. And he – the reason they're living here, this this whole thing happened because he's disabled. And again, I, I apologize for my dog. That is okay. She, she thinks that um, she needs to protect us from all the bad things in the world. Oh. And so that's what she's doing right now. She's doing her job. <laughs> um, she's she's so good. And this is part of being in quarantine. I am no longer in a studio. Um <laughs> So my dad has to use a walker and we had – we found him an Airbnb and it said it was accessible. It was not. He could mm. not get in the bathroom. And I think I told you at the beginning, my house was um, – these elderly people lived here. So my shower has oh, the uh, ADA bars. bars. Yeah. And and it's and it's like very accessible. So um, it was one, it was like this moment where we were like – we realized – that they were now here, they were now living in California with us, that um, uh, that he could not go to the bathroom in the Airbnb that we had rented for him Mm -hmm. and that there was only one option. We all had that happen to us (laughs) at the same moment. It was like, all right, well, let's do it. And so they've been here since September. And they have a place that they're fixing up Mm -hmm. in Carmel, which is beautiful. But it's not going to be ready till probably January. Big eyes again. We're getting some big eyes here. Let me let me make sure that they can see the big eyes again. These are. <laughs> 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 uh, I just it's not natural for adult children to live with their no parents. It's not. It's just not natural. Um, we are doing the best we can, and uh, and I think that we will survive my dog might not survive i am very annoyed with my dog right now oh what's she, aside from the bar- just the barking or is just there the more barking. just the barking just yeah. the barking she's a great dog i love her so much but she's um she's a protector mm. what kind is she uh i don't know she's like a 50 pound street dog <laughs> that was on a kill list and had a pretty rough and tumble Mm-hmm. early early childhood um and we rescued her uh and she's the greatest being i've ever known like she's my favorite child <laughs> i <laughs> she's perfect i love her but i think because she was a street dog she she feels she looks ferocious like when she's coming at you and she's barking mm-hmm. it feels very scary um that's actually but good she's the, I mean, not for She's you. So but... gentle. No, I know it's yeah. it's good. I actually I read an article years ago that said they interviewed all these robbers and criminals, <laughs> and they they said the the scariest deterrent are is a dog. Yes, I that, feel like that's I've heard that scarier than any alarm system or anything. So she she does serve that that purpose. Um, but yeah, she she's she's a great she's a a great addition to the family. I do love her. Her name's Una. Una, that's so yeah. cute. Yeah, um, she's cute. Let's do some "Hey, go fuck yourself." This is where we let people know that they what they can do. And now, this I recently brought this back. I hadn't been doing this segment for a long time, and then why? It just, 
Why? You know, it's so great. Thank you. Um, why did I stop doing it? You know, it started because I was bitching to my, I mean, like eight years ago, bitching to my husband, Daniel, about some shitty tweet I had gotten or something. And he's like, why don't you call him out on the show? And I was like, ooh, that's good. And then Mm. I worried that I was encouraging that kind of stuff by like shining a light on it. And but then it kind of morphed into now it's it still can be like an individual person, but it's other stuff, too. And I don't know. I don't know why I stopped. Well, some kind of lapse in judgment. Thank you. I love it. I love it. I'm 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 trying. I'm scouring my text messages for the one that I have brought to the table. Oh, great. Well, while you do that, I will play this. Great. Hey, 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 go fuck yourself. All right. I love all your music. It's so it's so fun and Thank podcasty. You. Once again, shout out to Trap Dog. I love I love you, Trap Dog. It's great. Okay, so how does this go? I just share it with you. Yeah, and then at a certain point, you just go like, "So listen, so and so," and then I'll, and then I'll play that. Oh, do I get to say? Oh, you say, so listen, and then you play it. Yeah, but if you, I mean, if you want to say the words, you can, and I'll play it after. Incredible. Okay, okay I'm yeah. loving this game. Okay, this feels very therapeutic. <laughs> okay, so um, like I said, we are living in the country, and all in all, people here are tremendously nice. Like there is this um, this sense that the South, you know, oh, Southern hospitality, and I did sense that when I lived in the South. Um, however, like when we moved here, someone drop, dropped off jam, oh, like wow. they picked up some moving boxes and dropped off jam. Another person like brought us a welcome to the neighborhood card, you know, just, I mean, I was like, what, who has the time to write a card? <laughs> right. Also, I don't want your germs. Please don't give me your shit. Um, <laughs> but it was, you know, very thoughtful. Um, so we're on this well system with five houses and and it's sort of off on this road and um you become very intimately connected with the people on your street in a way that i had never experienced living in the city with city water mm. um where like if one asshole on the block uses too much water it like drains the well or if there's a leak on someone's property mm-hmm. it impacts everyone and um we experienced this like very soon after we moved and so there's a lot of like group text messages about the well and about water consumption. And then there is this bill that gets sent out. This is like a total sidebar here. I'm just setting the scene for you. I'm just like giving you context. Yeah, no, I need to, I need to, I need to be enraged. Okay, good. So there's this um, bill that's sent out and they list everyone's water usage. Mm. Like they, it's so public shaming. It's like, (laughs) and we, and we use the most because we have, The two children who have to take baths and we have a lot of laundry and we have like when you have little kids, you Mm -hmm. use resources more. So then we're always sort of the context is I think that this neighbor that I'm about to talk about thinks that we are absolutely the worst. Like I think (laughs) she she hates us is what I think. Um, And like every time she goes outside, the dog does run towards her and tries (laughs) to like embarks at her. And I can tell that she's like. Get your beast away from me. Get your children away from me. Like, I could just tell she's like, they've lived here since 1999. We've moved in next door. Now, there is a lot of space in between the houses. Mm -hmm. But it feels like, um, you know, it feels like she's like, eh. That's that's my vibe that I'm getting. You don't feel embraced. She didn't bring you jam. No, she did not bring us jam. (laughs) I'd be waiting. Now for her the husband jam. seems a lot. Her husband seems like chiller, so she might listen. If she's listening to this podcast, I apologize that I'm saying all this about you. And let's get together from a distance and 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 hash it out. But basically, she sends. So she strays. She she breaks away from the group text Ooh. that we usually like do on the well, mm-hmm. <laughs> and she <laughs> breaks off to me and Mike, just so it's the three of us. Here's the text. I'm going to read it to you. Can't wait. Don't mean to be nosy. Ugh. Thank you. Anytime you start a fucking text like that, then why 
are you sending it? Check <laughs> yourself. Right. Okay, so don't mean to be nosy, but Tim noticed that your garbage cans weren't closed this morning. We got a notice in the mail about 20 days ago that said they will fine anyone about $15 a can if the lid isn't closed. They're taking pictures of all of our cans. <laughs> oh, my God. I was having a pretty fucked day when this text came in, um, so I did not take well to it. Mike responds. Mike, again, what a saint. Mm -hmm. We all know Mike is the fucking saint in the relationship. He responds, oh, we didn't see that, exclamation mark. Thanks for the heads up. Ugh. Then she texts a picture of the goddamn flyer that I also got in the fucking mail <laughs> 15 days ago, okay? And like, here, here, so this is what I said. Yeah, we accumulated a lot of trash over Thanksgiving. Plus, we always have lots of diapers that have to go in the trash, exclamation mark. We'll be more cognizant. But what I meant to say to her was like, I have a two-year-old. Like I, they give you this tiny little fucking can, mm. and we and we have. I recycle. I recycle. I have two giant recycling bins that I fill up every week as well. You know, we are using more resources than I would like. Um, but anyway, that would be. Uh, I was. I was. I was deeply uh, bothered by her text. I felt that it was extremely nosy. And actually, now that I'm looking at it, Allison. She made a typo. She said, don't mean to be noisy. Mm. So did she mean noisy or nosy? Either way, it's both. Oh, interesting. And what did she I mean? I know. I know. I literally just re-looked at it, and it says, don't mean to be noisy. I think she meant nosy. Probably. That's truly how I read it, because she was being fucking nosy. Yeah. So um, Mike literally, like, he, go he broke off of that thread and texted me directly. Let me pay the, the all caps. Let me pay the fucking fifteen dollars, Cheryl. <laughs> Charge me. And then he's like, "I'm calling. I'm calling waste management now." So we call waste management, and he got a bigger can for oh, us. God. But anyway, that is my go fuck yourself for the week, Cheryl. Hey, hey, hey! Go fuck yourself. Question though, it's mm -hmm. just you guys who have get the fifteen dollar charge, right? Or is it everyone? Yes. It's just you. It's so then just, what's so then why she really do you care? Does she think she's like, being helpful? This is what my either mother or father said. They're blending together now. I don't <laughs> uh know which one it was, but one of them said, Well, maybe she's just trying to help. I was like, Oh, go fuck yourself too. Yeah. Hey, if you're taking Cheryl's side, <laughs> hey, 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 go fuck yourself. So, I mean, don't you feel that that is just a completely, like, bogus, bananas, crazy thing to send to somebody? Especially if you don't know them. And you and we live next door. Like, right. why do you want to sour the relationship? Right. I also, I come from a stock that I'm like, I don't give a shit what you do. I truly do not care. If you... Want to accrue seventeen thousand dollars in garbage fines? I don't fucking care. It does not matter to me. Like, do what you want as long as it's not harming me. Do what you want. Is it if you have so much trash that it pushes the lid up? Yes. So that's so you felt trash shamed. Yes, I feel water shamed and trash shamed. Yeah. Ugh. Yeah, I would. I would. Mm -hmm. got, I would want to shake that one off too. I do. It was so, Zicky. Is she kind of like a Karen? No offense to Karen's. Yeah, I, I, I don't. Yes, I would. I would imagine. Show, I would imagine so. Yes, I. Yes. Sus I actually suspect she was trying. Well, no, I was going to say she's trying to be helpful, but I think she's using the trying to be helpful as a way of just get it climbing up your buns. I. It's just such a different person than I am, mm -hmm. or that I am accustomed to, right. that it's really hard for me to try to suss out her motivation. I feel a little bit like she's like got my eyes on you and your trash. Yeah, like I got your number. Yeah, like you think that you, you, you. Well, they're taking photos, and you know who else is? I am. Like she's <laughs> right. <laughs> so, and I, and I, I do think that they. I think they have grown children. I think. Which makes me feel even more. I'm like, dude, you see that I have little kids. Like, when you see a mom with little kids, don't you just feel a 
Like, I, I see you. I know mm. you're struggling. Right. I, why would you? Maybe she just is so far away from it that she doesn't recall the amount of poop that is in my garbage can <laughs> in diapers. Right. You know? I have a shitty kid. I mean, <laughs> there's a lot of shit in the can. How does this well system work? What is it like? I, I don't well, understand it. It's currently not working, to be honest with you. Um, we, I mean, this is another thing that happened. We basically moved here and within, you know, like a week <laughs> learned that there was all this well drama that we kind of bought into that we didn't really know about. Right. Um, the well is 60 years old. It's not pumping the amount of gallons per minute that you wanted to be pumping. So we had to put an exorbitant amount of money pretty much right when we moved into an account to start to dig a new well. And oh. then there's a lot of like weird money shame too because it's like there's five people on the block. Everyone's expected to put, you know, thousands and thousands of dollars into this account. And then it's like if one person doesn't do it, then they feel shitty. Right. It's it's wild. It's very it's very intense to be so tethered to your neighbors. For water. For water. I mean, when I lived in Houston, I lived on a street for five years and I never met like anyone. I mean, I think I knew my next door neighbor, but we were we pretty much kept to ourselves. Um, so it's a, it's a, it's a strange new world. I know a lot more about wells than I used to know. What I know <laughs> is that there's a flag. It's usually up when it's down. That mm. means that you're running quickly out of water. And currently, our flag has been down all week. So there's been a lot of, like, texting tension. And the garbage can thing was, like, on the heels of right. the well thing. And so I was just, like, not having it. Oh, that sounds <clears throat> awful. <laughs> <laughs> no, it really does, though. It really does. Like, to have to worry it's about. It's not great. Yeah, about whether you have enough water. Have you had a situation I mean, where you've turned on or flushed or tried to take a shower no. or anything? So you've been okay. no. That's why it feels very – it feels very like um, – I'm like, is there a problem? <laughs> do we need to dig a new right. well? Because I have yet to try to do a third load of laundry and not be able to do that mm -hmm. load of laundry. I have yet to go to fill up the bathtub and there not be water. So – I'm listening to the well expert, but there's this piece of me that's like, I think you guys are wrong. <laughs> I mean, I also think everyone is wrong about everything. I'm always like, oh, yeah, well, you know, like I want to challenge all the things. So I don't know. I don't know. We'll see. Today, today I really like had a a uh, like a Shirley MacLaine moment where I was like, I am I, <laughs> I was like ranting this morning. I am done having to go through this preacher dude who like is controlling the account to try to get to the well dude i was like mike just get the fucking number of the well dude so that we can talk to him ourselves and not have to deal with this weird intermediary who speaks like he's in a shakespeare play like i don't <laughs> i can't i mean like the this isn't part of go fuck yourself but but the text that he sent th this is how he speaks okay um, so this is like the self-elected captain of the well. This is the captain of the well. Um, I just spoke with Jason moments ago here on Friday. Oh, he God. indicated his ability to come to us this afternoon for pump function, function, <laughs> function and tank repair. I'm like, why? And then and then like our neighbor who's on the other side broke off the chain to text me and Mike to be like. <laughs> Yeah, fuck that dude. Let's uh, <laughs> let's call Jason ourselves. So there's like a lot of very interesting neighbor dynamics. Um, but then like our neighbors across the street, I love them. They're an Indian family and they bring this incredible food like once a week to us, like the most amazing home cooked meals. Like I think they may must feel like we don't have a kitchen or something because they're constantly <laughs> feeding us. Um, so th there are lovely parts of it, but uh, it's just it's just wild. It's just like a whole new terrain. And I and I think I will be writing a, a work of fiction at yes. some point now about these dynamics. When you are in your separate threads, do you like check a few times to make sure that it's going to the right place? I always do that. Good. I always do that. I mean, don't you do that? I do that yes. for every yes, thread. But I always on. hear of people being like, I always hear of uh of people who mess that up and it like chills me. Yeah. 
sending it to oh, the Oh, I know. I, yeah. I have done that before. I have done that before. I have said something terrible. To that, the person that you're talking about? Did you get caught? Yeah. 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 It was awful. It was one of my worst moments as a human. I, f- I still to this day feel awful. It was when I was like – um, it was like me saying to another – colleague about another work person and then it was like the wrong thread and it was so not cool so, uh, it, i was i mean she she was a hundred percent in the wrong but like it no one needs to be said no one needs to think that somebody's saying something about them you right. know behind their backs which i was at the moment yeah. um and i just like totally fucked it up <laughs> It was like really devastating. So I, I'm constantly paranoid that I'm on the wrong thread. So much so that I sometimes won't send an email that I need to send. Like I, I will not forward things. I feel mm-hmm. very yeah afraid of forwards. Um, I just always feel like I'm gonna fuck it up mm-hmm. if, if possible. So I'm sure the the moral of the story is I will say something terrible about Cheryl to her face on a thread thinking she's not on it at some point in our lives. But it hasn't happened yet, so hang on to that. Not yet. <laughs> not today. <laughs> um, let's do – you know you know what? I have a hey, go fuck yourself as well. And I feel like I've been beating this drum on my podcast, and this person probably doesn't deserve it. I'm not going to name them, although I feel like I've said enough on other podcasts that people have put it together. But there's just someone who is being – very, very social right now, <gasps> um, publicly, and like, sh- and in this person's Instagram stories and pictures and stuff, shows them do they they all do like a lot of rapid COVID tests. So, and they, sh- you know, so in theory, like it is safe. However, I don't think those ones are that accurate. But it's more just that, like. Having endless galas with beautiful, famous people feels uh, inconsiderate and icky to me right now. It just feels like the whole, like, that's not what we're supposed to be doing. And if you're going to do it, Mm. Mm -hmm. lock it down a little bit. Keep it to yourself. Yeah. Don't make people, and now people have been like, or maybe just I have been like, are you jealous? Like, do you wish you were invited? And yes, I do. But I'm not. So therefore, I can stand here and say, hey, that is very not what we're doing right now. Oh, my gosh. Hey, hey, go fuck yourself. Yeah. I don't know. It just it just strikes me as like in a famine, taking lots of pictures of yourself, like with your buffet. Are we talking about Kim Kardashian or we're talking about someone else? Someone else just happened. Yeah. But I'm like. But I mean, she is like that, too. Like, I feel like there's a lot of fabulous people who are like not going to let a pandemic stop their fabulousness. Um, And it bothers me. Uh, Put your fabulousness on ice, I say. All right. Do you have a um, Just Me or Everyone? And let me play that song. Sometimes I ponder on something I have thought or done. Is it just me or everyone? All right. Now, I do accept Just Me or Everyone's on Twitter, so tweet them to at A-R-I-Y-N-B-F and use hashtag J-M-O-E for Just Me or Everyone, and and we will talk about your JMOs, but also I like to get them from my guests. Um, I'm so sorry, Allison. Um, that is okay. Lit- li- 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 literally just got a text from Cheryl. A voicemail from her husband, Tim. <gasps> Do you need to listen to it? No. No. I don't want to listen to it. I have like PTSD. <laughs> Sorry. I was just like, I never would have done that. But we were literally just talking yeah. about the people. I'm like, why are you calling me? God. Do you have, do you have, does your phone transcribe? My phone stopped transcribing. Yes, that's what I... No, my phone transcribed. So I, it, he's asking about... Hey, Stephanie, this is uh, Tim. And... I was, uh, Mike was looking for some firewood, and we got a wood burning stove. And I've got some links that are too long for my wood burning stove. Uh, if you want them, uh, Mike can call me. 
This is country life. He's trying to make up for Cheryl. He knows she's it, a lot to take. She's out of her fucking lane. <laughs> yeah. He's trying she's to out of her fucking it. lane. Yeah. It's too it's too late, Tim. It's too late. You made the choice when you married <laughs> That's her. Right. Think if the story Tim could tell, like his whole life, he's always trying to like patch things up when Cheryl does her Cheryl biz. Oh my God. The, don't you I mean, it seems to me judging strictly from your um your social media and also I think I've met your husband like once peripherally. Mm. Uh he seems also very nice. Uh and like he's not gonna be the guy that like is embarrassing you all the time. I also have a very nice husband mm-hmm. who we have I'm sweet, sure I am embarrassing husbands. him. Yeah. <laughs> like I think I'm the Cheryl in the situation probably. Uh-huh. Um but it's really nice to have a partner who doesn't like have make a- me feel like like have to yeah have to do that. Yes. Have to call about firewood. Right. Yes. To patch it up. Yes. All right. Is this me or everyone? Great. Do you want me to share mine now? Please do. Yes. <laughs> okay. I hate showering. Hate showering. Like, I don't like to. I, I've i always felt this way. It has become worse in a pandemic where I feel like there is no, there's truly no point at this, mm. at this point. But I've always felt that it is a waste of time to get wet only to have to get dry again. It feels like. I, and then I, 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 it, it, it feels like um, just a waste. I don't know. And and the thing is, I don't. Mike and I have talked about this so many times in our marriage, but I don't, I don't smell. I don't have like a very. I mean, I think he would tell me. He is very nice, but I think he would be honest. There's not a pungent odor, right? right. I can, f- I can see like my hair at some point. I'm like, okay, I need to, I need to wash my hair, and mm-hmm. you know. This isn't socially acceptable, I assume, to be. But, like, I truly I, – I don't think – like, my dad, my dad, this might be genetic. He showers at this point, like, once a week. He's, like, once a week showering. Mm-hmm. Um, he's also very smelly, so he <laughs> should probably shower more. Um, but it is not my belief that I am producing the amount of body odor that he's producing. But I know, like, a lot of people love to get in the water. Like, I, Mike showers every day. He likes to shower. So I don't know. I guess that's my – is it me or everyone? Like, does everyone think showering is annoying or is it just me? I'm sure it's not just you, but it's not everyone. Um, my mm. thing with showering is I've realized when I'm in the shower – I really like it. Like, it really feels good. I like the warm water. Uh, I feel like I'm getting clean. And then when I'm showered, I'm really happy that I did that. For me, it's sort of yeah. like pressing a reset button, like especially if I'm feeling depressed or something. It Like, it it makes me feel like I'm doing something. Um, however, yeah. the amount of stalling before getting in the shower is incredible. And I think to yeah. myself, why am I resisting this? Like, I'll get back into bed and give myself a little nap so that, like, just to reward myself for the shower I'm going to take. Like, yeah. why do I treat it, given that I like it, why why do I act like it's something I really don't want to do? And I think it's, it is the idea of, like, having to take off my clothes and then get cold and then get wet. And it's like, there's nothing inviting about that, even though I like it. No, I know. Well, um, somebody told me, my friend from high school sent me. This is like, oh, I wish I was this person. I wish I was this person. And I do aim to be this person that sends cute, adorable gifts to people um, that are so thoughtful. I would love to be. I'm so not that person. Handwritten notes. I am so not that person either. Yeah. But she sent me this beautiful um, uh, body wash that's like very expensive and indulgent and I would never – ever fucking buy something like i buy cvs brand do you think it was a hint body soap possibly <laughs> she lives in a different city though so i don't think she can okay. smell me <laughs> um but it was like this lovely gorgeous bottle of soap and then the note said take a nap or no sorry take a shower every day it's like a liquid nap she Aww. called it a liquid nap and i thought that was she's, so cute she's wrong it's cute but she's wrong yeah i agree i, I this is the thing it I don't ever have time. I think maybe before I had children, it was different. But now I don't have time to shower in the morning because Mm -hmm. I have kids who are all over me and they're in the bed in the morning. Every fucking morning they're in the bed and 
then like the second my son wakes up, he's like, I want this, I want this, I want yeah. barking demands, barking demands. And so there's no time to do in the morning. So that means that I have to do it at night. And and I work so many hours. Like I'm I'm still usually working, you know, I, I work like 12 to 14 hour days at mm-hmm. this point. So it's like when I finish the day, I want to lay in bed and watch TV. Yes. That is all I want to fucking do. I don't want to spend time getting clean or getting in the shower and then having to, um, you know, have wet hair that's then going to be on the pillow and then get the pillow wet. And then right. my hair's going to look shitty the next day because I slept on wet hair. And it's just a whole thing. Mm-hmm. People don't it's get it. It's just a whole thing, Allison. That's just. I get it. I get it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I totally get it. That's a really solid one. Um, yeah, there are people who just hop in the show. Like my producer, Tony, who's listening to this right now. Not right now, but will be listening to this right now. Uh, you know, he we've gone through this. He takes a shower every day. Before I think before he checks, maybe he checks his I don't know, his phone might go with him into the bathroom. But like he gets up, he goes in the bathroom, takes a shower and then starts his day. Every single day. He, he must not have it. children, right? He, oh, he doesn't. He doesn't. Yeah. I mean, I think this is a, that is a luxury. Yeah. Yeah. Tony that... feel bad about it. Yeah, Tony. Yeah, Tony. Go fuck yourself. Oh, yeah. Tony. Hey, Tony, with your, oh, Showers. I just take a shower every day. Hey, 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 go fuck yourself. <laughs> Take that, Tony. Yeah. No, I'm I, I'm just jealous, is what I am. I, I I'm I do think that there was a time in my life before what it is now, where I indulged myself in showers and daytime television and naps and going to the gym and and investing in my self care. <laughs> and now I am who I am. And well, yeah, it's like no going back. An ongoing funny thing that happens in this house is that when I take a shower, my husband is, or like if I shower, if I'm about to shower, he'll be like, are you, are you doing a podcast today? And I'm like, no, why? And he's like, why? He literally said this. Why are you taking care of yourself? <laughs> and I'm like, is it that infrequent? He's like, yeah. <laughs> I know. I, I get that true. too. My, my, they're like, why are you wearing pants? <laughs> why are you, right. what do you, why do you look like that? <laughs> like, right. Oh, how the mighty have fallen. Uh, my, my daughter like accidentally stumbled on my wedding video on my mom's phone the other mm-hmm. day. And so we were watching it and I was like blown away by how pretty I looked mm-hmm. and how put together and how like thin and how just fresh and then the joy the joy that i felt that i was just dripping you know with joy yeah it was just truly like holy moly things have changed <laughs> not, not that i don't feel joy but man i know I what mean, you mean it's just wild it's like wow i lived that day there was a day where i was that happy <laughs> wow <laughs> amazing yeah and it's showered. interesting i, I i've now hit that the, oh sorry go ahead i said i took a shower that day <laughs> on my wedding <laughs> that's what my wedding day. <laughs> yeah um yeah i've now hit a stage in life where i can look back at photos and like see them in a in a because it's not like i did haven't periodically looked at old photos but now i look at them and like i see the person i was like i was a child then i was you know i was yeah I don't know. Everything looks different. I feel like the pandemic fucking with us. Too much time. It's it's a it's a bad time. It's a bad time. It's bad and it's hard and it's not going to be over. I know. Anytime soon. I know. On that fun note, (laughs) I have to say it was so delightful connecting with you. Thank you so, so, so much. I always love having you on the show. We are real friends, so you have to come back. I know. I know we are real friends. And I also genuinely like coming on your show. Thank you. I feel like when I see that on the calendar, I'm like, oh, yay. It's, (laughs) It's always fun to talk to you. So I feel the same. I'm glad you keep wanting me to come on. (laughs) Tell everyone where they can find you. 
Um, okay, you can find Last Day on all the places you get this podcast. Spotify, Apple, Stitcher. I never do Spotify first. Interesting. Apple, Spotify, Stitcher, uh, Google Play. I don't know where you get podcasts. Wherever you get them, you can you can get, get Last Day. Um, we have 10 shows at Lemonada, 10 podcasts, and you can find all of those at LemonadaMedia.com, and it's L-E-M-O-N-A-D-A. And then you can find us on Instagram, Twitter, at Lemonada Media, and you can find me at Whittle Stephanie on Twitter, Instagram, all those places. You can look at pictures of my life in the country and feel very envious and then simultaneously not envious that you don't have to deal with a well system and Cheryl. Yeah, knowing about the well system and Cheryl has changed my mind about all of this. <laughs> Yeah. Actually, don't air any of that. I really just want it to be very idyllic. No, <laughs> I'm kidding. It's fine. We can we can tell the truth. I like to tell the truth about things. I um, like it. So, yeah. Thank um, you. And if you like what you're hearing, which I hope you do, please make sure you're subscribed to Allison Rosen as your new best friend. And I, I'm going to I'm going to use your language. I'm begging of you. <laughs> Please click five stars, leave a nice comment wherever you're listening. It helps out the show so much. Um, also, check out my parenting ish podcast that I say ish because you don't have to have children uh, to enjoy it. Um, and I'd say like half of our listeners don't. That my parenting podcast that I do with Greg Fitzsimmons, it's called Childish. And I'm on Patreon, patreon.com slash Allison Rosen. Uh, bonus episodes each week. I do a Zoom party live stream, all sorts of fun stuff. I'm also on Cameo. And um, make sure you're subscribed to me on YouTube as well, youtube.com slash Allison Rosen, uh, because I'm basing my self-worth on those numbers. So help me stay above water. Um, did I leave anything out? No, I feel like... Oh my like, God, that is so much. You're so impressive. I feel like, that is a lot of things. Thank you very much. Things. I feel like I need to do what you... Because you don't say it on each episode, right? You just play a thing that includes all those things. Yep, I've got my credits. Yeah. And they just... Play them each time. I was I was inspired to do something similar, but right now it's just you're getting the real live plug a thon. I love it. I love it, and I agree with her. You go and subscribe to all of that stuff that she just said, and all the stuff she that is. Thank you that she said yes. exactly, right. and also I also derive my self worth from my numbers. Yeah. So you need to know that every time you. <laughs> Don't listen or subscribe. Right. That we are in the corner shaking and rocking and feeling completely worthless. That's right. <laughs> Don't do that to us. <laughs> Don't do that to us. Um, <laughs> you guys, thank you so much for listening. I love you. You matter. Goodbye. Hey, do you know about the Allison Rosen show? We had a good time, but now we gotta go. 